It's the My First Gig Podcast, whoa, sharing stories of first gigs and shows, comedian sharing their memories, the fun and entertaining, exciting and crazy, with Dwayne Dugan as your host, it's the My First Gig Podcast, here we Hello and welcome to another edition of the My First Gig podcast, back again with the second isolation interview. If you weren't here last week, last week Todd Barry kicked off season two. Wasn't meant to happen for quite some time, but we thought, why not sit down and chat with comedians also stuck in their homes around the globe. So last week was Todd Barry, straight out of New York City. This week, the guest is Emma Willman, straight out of Los Angeles, California, formerly of New York. And yeah, it was a great interview, fun time. If you're not familiar with Emma, I first came across Emma's work probably about a year and a half ago on the Netflix, the comedy lineup, those short 15 minute kind of sets. For anybody listening in the UK, I know Ashton B does one, Phil Wang does one. And then there's some great comedians from across the pond that you might not have heard of or might not have access to too much of their stuff. And Emma was one of those. I remember really enjoying her set. You may also know her as Beth from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Appearances on Stephen Colbert and much, much more. If you want to catch up with Emma, you can get her on Facebook at Emma Willman Comedy, Instagram at Emma Willman. Uh, I thought she was off of Twitter, but it turns out she's back on now under a new account at I am Emma Willman. And of course, on our website, emmacomedy.com. So guys, if you're listening to this, I'm going to tell you this, like I tell you every single week, head on over now to Twitter, head on over to Instagram, post on your stories and say, wow, just heard a great episode of My First Gig Podcast with Dwayne Dugan and the guest, Emma Willman. Please do that for me. You'll make my quarantine time much enjoyable. But before I get into the chat, here it is, April 1st, April Fool's Day. I thought I'd look up what April Fool's Day is about, and there's so much to read about this that I just, I I couldn't be arsed, to be honest. I started reading a lot about the history of it. Turns out there's many claims for April Fool's starting, one of them being that in France, New Year's Day was on March 25th. Don't ask me why. Isn't that mental? And they used to celebrate for a week, and I would end on April Fool's, and then the rest of the, all the other countries would be like, ha, France, you're dumb, you celebrate New Year's Day on March 25th. Ends on April 1st, you're a fool, an April fool. France didn't use New Year's Day on January 1st until the mid-16th century, which is like, what, the 1500s? I was about to say not that long ago. Long before me, but still, I don't understand that. Why are they celebrating? Who knows? In Holland, it started in 1572, where the Duke Alvarez was defeated. And this is the part I liked, and I'm going to adopt this phrase. There's a Dutch proverb, I'm going to butcher this now because I don't speak Dutch, up one April Velor Alva Zin Bril, which translate as on April 1st, Alva lost his glasses. Now, if I'm a duke, and I'm going to imagine that I understand what that means. If I'm some sort of royalty and power, and I'm at the time where I'm dueling and going up against people in like some sort of some public battles and fights, if I lose and I die, and then afterwards they say to me, Oh, Dwayne lost his glasses, that's like insult meets injury times a hundred so i think i'm gonna make that my new insult make that your new insult like if you walking down the road and you see someone fall you go oh you lost your glasses mate and he just look at you and he won't know i'd be like going oh god on the ground as he gets up looking for his glasses he doesn't even wear glasses what a fool doesn't even have to be april uh in 1698 the english philosopher john aubrey referred to it as fool's holy day as several people were tricked to going to the Tower of London to see lions get washed. How do you explain that? I know we're all on the big Tiger King craze or whatever, but who's like, do you want to go see some lions get washed? Yes, please. When <laughs> you show up. Like, going, wanting to do it is one thing, but then showing up and being like, ha ha, there's no lions being washed. You dumbass. I don't know. I started looking at some of the common traditions, and like, they're just, they're, a lot of them are quite boring. It turns out, only in England, or only in the UK, it's at the whole, you have to do the joke before midday. So if you're like Irish or American and you're doing that whole, get it in before midday, you're a Brit, which we don't mind. Forget that a lot of my listenerships are in the UK. We actually do like the, the British people. We just make a joke of it because of history. <laughs> history. But here's one thing. In Ireland, apparently, Ireland where I am, you have to give the victim an important letter, make them read it, and it just says, pass it on. And then you have to make them give it to somebody else. Like, that's not even a prank. Like, I didn't think 
one of the things, of all the things for me not to be proud of in my country, I didn't think some stupid April Fool's tradition would be it. In the Philippines, they celebrate April Fool's Day on December 27, 28 or 29th, which brings me back to the French celebrating New Year's Day in the middle of March. That's calendars aren't that hard to understand. April Fool's should be in April. It's like December 27, 28, 29 is that, well, that's the time we're in now, it feels like. Just eternally December 27, 28, 29. On that note, I hope you're all doing well. Keep insane. Hopefully some of these podcasts can keep you entertained for a little while. If you've enjoyed it, do follow me at my first gig pod across all social media. Follow me personally at Dwayne Dugan. Put up in your story, share a tweet, do whatever you need to do, follow and say, hey, nice podcast. Thanks for that. And find out who we have next week before anybody else. So please do that. I'm using notes for the first time as well. I bought a notebook. So my ramble is very organized today, which is why I won't ramble for too long. So when you say, <laughs> bit late for that, mate. And I say, shut up. We've got a podcast to listen to. So come on, cop on, sit down, relax. It's time for my first gig with Emma Willman. I have like mixed feelings. Like, I, I mean, it's, I don't, it's, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's all things considered. Like I'm here. I don't have any kids. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Like I'm not, it could be so much worse, but recently I've just been like eating nonstop and I'm, you know, not feeling great about that. I just am like constantly eating. Like I bought enough gummy bears for, I guess maybe like 9,000 people and I'm eating enough for like 1,000 a day. So yeah, but it could be worse. I mean, I really, I really feel like I can't complain about it because I'm in LA. I, I, I was in New York and I got out of there. Like I think I left like five days before shit hit the fan. Oh wow! Then I quarantined, and then now I've been like going on like walks and all that stuff. And I healthily, I feel fine, healthy, healthy wise, health wise. How how is it? How is it where you are? Yeah, it's like our, our our people are trying to kind of stay ahead of the curve. So like there's very, very kind of strict, like you can't leave the house unless it's for one of like four reasons kind of a thing. <laughs> what are the reasons they give you? Uh, I think it was, it's a shopping medical or one piece of daily exercise. Wow. Just one. Right. <laughs> Don't go exercising more than once. <laughs> I was nice going to do try, so buddy. much of it, yeah. Yeah. They're just like looking at muscle muscular people outside. Like, how much you been? <laughs> how much you been outside today, bud? So, I'm not like proud to say this, but I was doing gigs right up until it hit like the like chaos level, and which was, I guess, okay. So I came back from New York. I'm so bad with it. I can tell you exactly though. I came back from New York on the. I'm pulling it up on my calendar. I think I came back on the. Um, I came back Friday night. So March 13th, I came from New York to LA and I was in Vegas the first week, week in March doing shows for the week at the comedy cellar which, out there, which is, um, they have a club in New York and then it's also, they have one at a casino in Vegas. And like the writing was kind of on the wall, like, oh, people are getting sick. This is a problem. But I was, I, I was just, I mean, a casino was a pretty dumb place for me to be. And like when I would go on stage, I would like spritz the mic down that. So if probably if I feel the need to do that, I probably shouldn't be out performing. But I I did the shows and then I went from Vegas to New York, which was also a little bit weird. And then when I got to New York, the clubs were still open. And I think by like the Wednesday, that's when I I started feeling weird about what I was doing because I started being like, who are these people that are out? Why are they out? But they're out because people are still putting on shows so i didn't trust myself to not i'm like kind of like a junkie about comedy too so i was like i don't trust myself if i'm in new york to not do shows in la it's a lot easier to not do shows because you know i don't get booked on as many shows so they they make that decision for me over here Hmm. so so i was like i'm just gonna get back to la and i canceled i had a tv thing that i was supposed to do on the sunday in new york and i don't think i've ever canceled a tv thing before but i did and i think it got canceled anyway but i was doing it like i was doing it pretty right up until he said to stop and then i canceled this show and i had a show in dc in april and i was like look everything's been canceled around it i want to cancel this one show and i was like it doesn't make sense for me to fly from la to dc to do this one show i was supposed to be doing like a string of shows and my 
um, agent actually gave me a really hard time. He was like, you said you'd do it. You need to do it. And then I was like, I actually, I don't feel comfortable. But part of it was I didn't feel comfortable because of flying. But then also, I didn't really want to do it. So I (laughs) still wasn't taking it like, I was kind of like using, I was like using it almost to get out of something I didn't want to do. And then I'd say about a week ago, just everything got canceled. And I was like, oh, I have to, this is like very serious. And it's about much more than my, me having to cancel anything. Yeah. Like we, we were the same here. Like I, like I was the same as that. I wasn't as, as as far as shows were going ahead. It was like, look, I'll do them. I think the last show we did was the 13th. It was like St. Patrick's oh, okay, weekend. Thank you for saying that. Cause I actually was feeling bad as I was saying that I was still doing them. So you were, you, what is it like on St. Patrick's day there? Oh, it was like, it was, it was so quiet. Like we were advertising ourselves wow. as we're the only place open in town, <laughs> which wasn't smart. I was yeah. hosting a show and my girlfriend was meant to be on the show and she pulled out. She didn't feel comfortable doing it really? and before and be like, do you mind if I still go? <laughs> and yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. They pulled totally it on me it. and took the decision out of my hands. And that's, yeah, since then it's like, but like that was two weeks ago. It's crazy. It yeah. feels like four years ago. Totally. How far in the future are things cancelled for? Just two weeks here, but like it's going to be rolling and rolling. Like this bigger, bigger shows and stuff are cancelled all the way up until like June, July. Yeah, the bigger, because I've got a couple smaller shows in May that haven't been cancelled yet. I'm sure they're going to be. I'm actually mm. supposed to go to Vegas again in April, but I think that's going to get cancelled. Yeah, I think, I think April and May are pretty much going to. Shot. Yeah, all over. Well, it could be worse. It could be worse. It could, yeah. Eating gummy bears and sitting at home is not the worst, isn't it? <laughs> do you think that you're going to still want to do comedy when this thing passes? Oh, well, like, see, I just, like, are we all going to want to talk about things? Like, are we going to go up and, like, just talk about what we talked about beforehand? Yeah. And then they're like, oh, no, hold on, you got to talk about what everybody experienced. Right. But then everybody's going to talk about it. Totally. So maybe you won't want to hear about it. Exactly. Yeah. It's going to be a real, like, equalizer. And then, a, like, I was thinking t- about that because I was like, it feels like really a lot of my material is autobiographical. So I was like, it feels really self-indulgent to go be like, <laughs> so my, when I was a kid, I was fat and my sister was thin it, at, after everyone just came out of this. Like no one's going to give, no one's going to care. So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how people tie it in. It's going to be really, it's going to be really interesting thing to, to be a part of when we're lucky enough to get out of it. I think I think it's going to take a while for audiences to return. To be honest, yes. I think like even once the the walls and the kind of the permissions are are back, I think it'll be slow. Totally, I think people will like people will go to I don't know, let's say weddings or graduations or things like that. But like things that they don't have to go to, right? I think they might take a little step back. Imagine if you're having a wedding right about now. Woo! There's people doing them on the internet, which I'm not sure if that's oh, brilliant God. or terrible. I don't know if that's worse or doing a comedy show on the internet is worse. <laughs> I'm supposed to do one. I'm supposed to do one of those. Co- I'm supposed to. A college asked if I would switch it to a Zoom show and all the kids are home. And I was like, I don't know. I, I mean, I shouldn't say no because they're they're going to pay me the same amount of money. And uh, so I should do it. But I mean, <sighs> That I I don't know if I can, I mean doing an hour of material for no audience an hour I mean, wow yeah like the performance isn't can't be there like do you like did you stand up in front of a camera and do you like have the same swagger and the same, like I don't know I I mean if I, I don't think I can't do that I I couldn't I can't I can't do that I I it have to be me sitting down I just don't even and then also like if you an audience you know if they laugh that like. That's how my hours timed out incorporating other people. I don't know if I have a straight yeah. hour of just me. Well, will they be on the other end? Can you hear them laughing? The guy booking it said he was, he's, oh, they, he, he, I won't be able to hear them laughing, but if they type something, then I can see <laughs> that. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Or like you suck or something. <laughs> and then other people can't see what they're typing. So fuck. I think you need to do it now, actually. I know. I'm probably going to. Did you see Drew Michael's special? He recorded a whole special without an audience. No. So Drew Michael's a comic in New York. And about a year ago, he did an HBO special with no audience. And at the time, everyone was like, I mean, the general reviews. He's one. Of, I think he's one of my favorite comics. But the reviews of that special were that it was maybe a, a misjudgment to do it with no audience. But now. Ahead of the curve. Ahead of the curve. Wow. 
Yeah. We're going to talk about your first gig today. So, but before I do, I want to ask you, if I say to you, what's your first memory of comedy? What comes to mind for you? Okay, that's it. I appreciate the way you phrase that question because normally I would say my first memory of it is the first time I thought to do it like that it could be an option for me to do. But that's because people usually ask, when did you get started in comedy? Hmm. My my actual first memory of comedy was my parents got divorced when I was in third grade and my dad got I, I'm from really rural Maine and we didn't have cable and my mom didn't let us watch a lot of TV. And then my dad was like, I'll get cable, which is hard to do if you're like really in the country because the cable companies don't go out there. So he's like, I'll get cable if like kind of to like entice us to spend more time at his place, which I guess sounds a little sad. I didn't see it that way at the time. Oh, here. I went through the same thing. Competing Did parents you? was great. Yeah. Come on. Oh, yeah. Ah, <laughs> right. He's got cable. What's How many channels you got? So he got this cable package and it had um, BET, which had this show called Comic View. It was this show. I mean, I was like, this is before, I was must have been in like fifth grade. It was a show where, um, I don't know if it was before Def Jam, but it was definitely very like Def Jam-ish, like it, in that it was like very like more urban acts. Hmm. And they had a comic that hosted it named Bruce Bruce. And I didn't know that. It was I was watching stand up. I just thought I, I just love this guy, Bruce Bruce. And I remember thinking he was like just so funny. And I never would watch. He would bring up. He was hosting it. It was stand ups. I wouldn't really watch the stand ups. But I it was the thing where like, have you ever hosted a show? And then afterwards, someone like you should do comedy, too. Oh, God. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's why what you do. It's part of the thing. So I remember thinking that I was like, that guy is funny. But I didn't even know it was stand up. I just remember thinking he was really funny. And then I saw an episode of Seinfeld and I was like, oh, he's like on a stage doing stand up like Bruce Bruce. But that was my first memory of being like, okay, this is like a whole thing. It wasn't just the way Bruce Bruce talked. It was a whole like, and that's when I was like, okay, there's comedy and then there's stand up. But I really distinctly remember, remember thinking this guy was really funny. And that that's my first memory of, of comedy. And what about seeing actual stand-up comedy live did you see it before you tried it out or before you thought about trying it out no oh wait yes i did i had this friend that loved margaret cho when i was in college here's why i don't really think of this as going to a comedy show because i never went to a comedy show before besides i went to go see so margaret cho was in super famous when i was in college and she had this opening act that had a couple viral videos about um, shoe shopping. I remember, just remember they were like, let's get some shoes. There was like a line in it. And that person was opening for Margaret Cho. So I wanted to see the shoe person. My friend wanted to see Margaret Cho. We paid like $80 and we got these total nosebleed seats at this huge theater in Boston. And it was, it was packed, like totally sold out. It was like a rock concert. And we were, we were, we had like shit seats. So it was, you could hardly see the stage and it was just, I remember it was mostly gay men and they were like screaming along to her jokes like it was a rock concert. So I didn't even, I guess I didn't think of that as stand up just because it was, it really felt like a rock concert and I wasn't familiar with her comedy. I was there to see the opener. So that was the first comedy show I went to, but like the first time I really saw someone do stand up was the same night where I was like, oh, not that she wasn't doing stand up. The same time I realized I was seeing stand up. Sure. It was the same night where I was like, which was, I'd say, like four or five years after that. So what happened then when you decided that you wanted to give it a go yourself? Like, was there much time difference between this? Yeah, it was a couple of years and it was kind of the perfect cocktail. Like, it was like, I had a really good experience in college. I never thought I'd be able to do well in, in school. And then I did well because I was in like special ed. I'm dyslexic. I had, I had ADHD. Like, but then when I went to college, I like managed to do really well in school. So I was like, ah. Oh, I can do anything. And I I got this, I wanted to like be an inventor and I got a job as a recruiter, like totally all over the place. And I got fired from my job. And the thing I tried to invent, I sent to like a scam developer. So it was the same week. So I'm, I'm like, cr I was like crushed. Living at my mom's, I was, any money I was making, I'm sending to try to like be an inventor. And and I remember then going to this party and this girl was doing stand up at the party. And I was kind of, and I remember they were like giving her nothing to work with. And she used the word, um, tranny. And, uh, 
people flipped on her. Like she 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 said it pretty offhand and people it was like this party in um this really liberal part of Boston and I remember she said it and it was like I like I was like scared for her cuz it was we were in a basement and she was doing it literally into a karaoke mic in the corner. And people there it was just like this like rumbling of like oh you can't and she wrapped it up pretty quickly after that. And then I went over to her and started talking to her. And I was like, what was, what's, what is this? And she was like, I'm trying to do stand up. And which, I mean, in retrospect, asking someone what they're doing after they've done stand up <laughs> is like the worst. <laughs> what was that? I was trying to do stand up. But she, um, she like told me about some clubs in Boston, but it was like, I like had n- everything had like fallen through. I mean, in my mind, I was only 24. So I was like, I I was in a relationship I didn't really want to be in. I thought that I was going to be like successful inventor. And then I had this job I found on Craigslist that I hated. And and I was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to try that because I was always definitely the class clown. So I was like, oh, I'm going to let me like, how do I try that? And then I signed up for a comedy class. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. A lot of people kind of go through the class route. Yep. Do they have the, this is probably a dumb question, but is that a big thing? Is that is that more of an American thing or do you guys have that, too? No, that yeah, I think that exists everywhere. Yeah, like I, I've Irish acts. I went through one myself. Uh, a lot of English acts I've talked to went through the same thing. Yep. I think it's the fear of walking into a show. You you know you can't go there. You almost have to go to someone who's going to like baby step you along the way, kind of a thing. For sure. Plus, it's it's like almost inconceivable unless you've started like. I mean, now it's like there's so many blogs and th- and podcasts and stuff where you can get all this info. You know, like ten years ago. I remember I found one blog that I would read all constantly. This a guy named Matt Ruby has a blog called Sandpaper Suite, and I would just read that. And um, the former Booker of the Tonight Show, Eddie Brill, had a blog. Other than that, I couldn't find. And there's a couple books, but other than that, I was like, "Where the fuck? Where do I get info about this?" And a comedy class was like the most logical step I could think of. I, I, I'm very interested. It's a sidetrack, but I'm very interested in what's the invention that you had that you sent off. Oh boy. So I tried to, I wanted to come up, I came up with like a few different things. And I know like a lot of people are like, oh, I tried to invent something. So I always love hearing people's uh, things they want to invent. The one I went with was this thing called stop to scuff that you put in the bottom of your pants and it's supposed to protect them from scuffing. So I thought it'd be good, like, because I was always getting my pants hemmed. So I was like, oh, it's like a condom for your pants bottom. So stop the scuff buffer between your pants and the ground that was my big idea yeah so i was like i need to get a product prototype so i can see if this doesn't look ridiculous on people's pants <laughs> and i sent it to some guy and he was like yeah send me a thousand bucks and i'll make it so i get sent him my graduation money and then like six months later he was like oh you got to send me more money and i was like well you haven't done anything and he and then i like looked up the quote-unquote company and i was like hey this isn't legit. And then he like blocked my number. Oh, God. It was my fault. I remember I talking to a lawyer about it and he was like, look, you need to do your due. This is before I even talked to the guy because I was like, look, I can get a patent for a thousand bucks. And he was like, you can't do your due diligence, hire a lawyer, do it the right way. If you cut corners, you're going to get screwed over. And I was like, fuck this guy. <laughs> and but that's what I tried to invent. It, was, it wasn't meant to be. So you go to this comedy class. Where was the, the, the comedy class? It was at Improv Boston, and I was so delusional that they had – okay, they had three classes, like beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And I was like – and each class, I think, was either three weeks or a month, meeting once a week. Mm. And I remember being like, oh, perfect. I'll do these classes. So three weeks each class. So in nine weeks, I'll be able to go pro. I thought of it as like a like a vocational thing where it's like you do the class, and then boom, and then you get – you know, who someone hires you. Yeah, I didn't. So I was like, I remember I was on unemployment and my mom was like, are you looking for jobs? And I was like, well, my unemployment is going to be up, you know, way after I graduate my comedy classes. So I'm actually ahead of the curve because I'll in nine weeks, I'll be I'll have my comedy job and then we'll be good to go. <laughs> and she thought, fuck, I'm sure she was. Actually, she. I remember she started being like, "You got to go to grad school. Like, you got to go to grad school." Any memories of the class? Like, any memories of the 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 teacher or other other people in the class? Dwayne, I remember that class so vividly. Okay. Like, 
Do you remember your class vividly? I remember mine so well. Yeah, mine was only about five years ago now, but yeah, it's, um, I remember faces, but I, I couldn't tell you, like people have asked me since, like, what, what, what did we do? And I actually don't have a clue. I don't remember any of the stuff I learned, like in the class, but I remember the, I remember the people, I remember he taught us how to take the mic out of the stand. Because the problem too is everyone was kind of trying to impress each other. Like we all have egos in it. Yeah. Now, if I did a class, I'd be like, let's workshop jokes. But at the time we didn't. I remember I thought the teacher who was such a nice guy, I thought he was famous. In my brain, I was like, oh my God, he's famous. And I get, I, I don't, I, he, he never said he was. I just, to me, I was like, I saw him on stage at the show he ran for the comedy school. And I was like, he's, this is a famous person. And it took like actually years for me to be like, oh, huh. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean someone's famous just because you see them on. Like, I remember seeing the introductions where I'd be like, this person does clubs and colleges all over the country. And I didn't know that that can be made up. Like I was like, oh, they, clubs and colleges all over the country. This guy, I haven't heard of him, but this guy's famous. <laughs> so I really remember that. And, I, and then I had this friend, Mike, who we did the class together. And and we kind of, I stayed in touch with some of the students from it. But then I don't think any of them do comedy anymore. But I, I just remember like we'd all sit in this like tiny room and say our jokes, which must have been so fucking brutal because none of us had ever done stand up before. So I can't even, I mean, I think what the teacher gets paid for is to listen to that like pure shit and not tell you to just go do an open mic. I mean, it's, and I, then I went and started doing some open mics actually with my friend I made in the class, Mike. And that's where I started being like, oh, I'm not going to be a professional comedian by the, in the next nine weeks. Okay, so like generally you do the classes and there's like a graduation gig or something, but you went ahead and you go, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this out. Yeah. Okay. I tried to do that. He was like, you can, you, you guys should do open mics, and so I went to some open mics, and that's a very different environment because you go from a class where everyone's like, you know, I don't know, it's a very cushy, and then you go to an open mic, and I started in Boston, which is a pretty competitive scene, and an open mic is like, all right, you're signing up, you're going on at like two a.m. for the one person you walked in with because everyone's left by then. So that that was where I was like, oh shit, there's a lot of people trying to do this. And and then it was do I wasn't doing open mics all the time though. I remember I did a couple, did the graduation show. I wouldn't count that as my the first gig that I would say that I had is not that though. I'll tell you about that one. But I but I remember doing that graduation show and then going to the mics and then that's when I was like, oh this is like really hard. Like this is a this is because I remember seeing people in Boston who'd been doing it for years and years and years that were like, j you know, still just trying to get their name out there just a little bit. Mm. So that's when I was like, or I remember seeing people that had been on this thing called Live at Gotham. So there's a couple people from Boston that had done this show in New York that was on cable. And I, so I was like, wait, why are they still at these bar shows in Boston? Shouldn't they be in L.A. with like with Pup, like Master P or whoever <laughs> like was famous to me at the time? So I was I was very very um naive about the process so if the graduation gig's not your first gig what what would you consider your first gig okay i wish the graduation gig maybe i should count that as my first one because that was fun i mean i remember my i remember that was that, that was fun but the first like for real gig was a fuck i mean where it was like i'm really considering it a gig where it wasn't something where i did like an open mic or in front of friends so this guy hits me up on facebook and he's like, do you want to do a real show? I'm like, oh, yeah. He goes, yeah, I think you've got a good look. If, if you're funny, you kind of look like Ellen, so you might really be onto something. And he's like, and I see a lot of comedy. I own – um, it was like Joe's Crab Shack in, in uh, West Warwick, Rhode Island. He's like, I own Joe's Crab Shack, and we have a talent night. So I know talent, and I think you might have some talent. So I'm like, this is it. This is it. So he's like, yep, I'll book you in the next couple months. Come with your best five minutes. And either he didn't tell me or I didn't take it in. He said, oh, he was like, you need to bring some people. And I didn't know about bringer shows. So I didn't know it was like, you need to bring some people. So I invite my mom because I'm like, mom, you got to see me kill at this show. <laughs> like, this is going to be like, then you will see. So I was like really excited. We were supposed to go to the show and then I, I look up the address and I thought it was like half an hour from where we were and it was like three hours and I was like oh this isn't in the part of Rhode Island I thought it was in so then she's like all right let's not do this reschedule I'm like begging 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 please 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 you know this is it I'll meet someone here that'll this and that and this and that 
So she drives me to this show. We park, and I remember, I remember parking behind a truck that had a Confederate flag on it. And my mom was like, where are we? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. So we, we shimmy in behind this truck. It was like the only parking spot. We walk in. The guy's like, where are your other people? And I was like, oh, I just brought my mom. He's like, well, you have, you can't, you can't perform. We, you need to bring other people. And I was like, he was like, you, yeah, you can't. And I was like, well, what if I buy their tickets and then I'll, I'll pay you for the tickets? So he's like, yep, no problem. So then I paid him. He's like, it's $30 a ticket, something ridiculous. So I paid him like, say it was like 180 bucks or something. Wow. I probably had to borrow the money from my mom. Like it was just a shit thing. So he's like, okay, you have four minutes. It's a competition. You wait over there. Your mom has to wait over here. And I remember just putting my car down at the bar and I was like, mom, please get drunk. Please get drunk. Because I knew it was like going to be a shit show. There was a guy with like mutton chops, like eyeing her. At least I remember it that way. So there, the mic setup sucks. It's, it's literally in a crab shack. People are eating crabs. It's noisy. It's a mess. I go up and it's awful. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Even if I did, it was like a really bad setup for comedy. I remember the it was a really low ceiling, which normally is good for sound. But this man, this was like, you could hear the like, like people popping open crabs. And I go up and uh, I, I wish I could remember if I went up before or after this guy who killed. I think I went up right before him. Oh, Yeah. Because I went up and I was like, I remember being like, oh, I think maybe they don't like me because I look funny. Like, I, if you've never seen it, I was like, I, maybe they don't like me because I'm gay. Like, and I've got short hair and they can tell. So maybe that's what it was. But also, I just like sucked. So the guy that goes up after me is a very flamboyant gay guy and he murders, murders. And then he wins the whole competition. And I think I probably did like four minutes max. And then I had to wait until the end of the show, which was like three hours. My mom was like, can we leave? And I was like, no, wait, I guess I have to wait. And then I just remember driving home with her and we, it, it was the, that was the worst drive. Just three hours of her being like, what are you going to do? Like, what are you doing? And I was trying to answer her while I was also trying to answer to myself where I was like, I don't know. And that is when I downloaded an application to, to go to grad school. I went to fucking grad school. Wow, yeah. Because of that first gig. That's oh, that's a that's a heavy first gig for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like I can't like for someone to to reach out to you online and recruit you three hours away to a bringer show. I <laughs> that's insanity to me. Like what what a guy. I mean, it wasn't even a comedy club. It was it was a crab shack. God. Literally, like it wasn't even like this guy was. It wasn't even. I mean, who's to blame him? I can't. I think the place went out of business or something. Like it was like. It was, and there's so many shows you can do in Boston. We can't leave many one star reviews, so you can't. But I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, but like you know, when you're starting out, you know, who are you to know? Like when somebody reaches out to you, you're like, oh my god, this is this, you know? Oh yeah. And you'll 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 say yes to every gig that that's offered to you for sure. Of course, I still pretty much do. I mean, I have like it's so hard to say no. It just gets so ingrained in you to say yes to everything that then when you're like, wait, I shouldn't do this. It's it's too far away for me to do for what I'm getting paid or I mean, there's such a premium on getting the stage time. Mm. But like it's so it's so hard to like when you don't need when you are get I don't know if you feel this way. I, I feel like it's always like it's like you're there's never enough. But like it, something in New York, especially when there's just so many shows and then if you're doing shows on the weekend and you're performing there is enough. And there's a certain point where it's like, you're not improving by getting up six times a night. You're not improving by getting up four times a night. Are you ever, are you writing? Are you listening to your recordings? Are you being smart about it? Or are you just running yourself ragged on the high of it? So that was something I had to like learn to weigh, but I, it's still hard to say no to stuff. Even if it's like, if that fucking guy hit me up right now, Emma, Joe from Joe's Crab Shack, how you doing? I would feel some weird... I'd, I wouldn't just be like, no, I'd literally, it would be, I don't know if it's because I've been quarantined for now for a couple of <laughs> weeks, but I would, <laughs> I would, I don't know. I wouldn't, it's just, it's really hard to untrain yourself, those type of, that thinking. Yeah, I get what you mean. I, w- I want to go back to that night now. So obviously that's a real, like, like what, you're talking a three hour drive back. Yeah. The way a mother is going to think, you know, of course you can't, you can't fault them, but like as well. You know, previously you're going. No, I'm not going to go to grad school. 
I've got this going on. And then you yourself are trying to convince yourself and then you're downloading this app. Like, what's, I don't know, I guess what, what happens next? Are you, it, like, in your head, are you done now? Is that it? No, like, not even close. I was just like, shit, this is tricky. But that was almost when I, like, really, that's when I started getting cranking. Because I'm like, all right, like, what is going on? Like, wh- what is this? Who are these Who are these other people? And also, I remember, I was like, who are these other people? And that was the first time, I remember the host told the joke. It, it, to this day, it was one of the, I was like, what? It was about how it's okay to rape, I think he said Korean women, because it already looks like they're crying. And I remember when he said that, I was like, j- like that, I was just like, whoa. And however he f- packaged that, got a laugh. And that was the first time where I was like, okay, when people laugh, they're co-signing something. I mean, they can laugh and not and be like shocked by something. But when you – the way that that was, like it was – I was just like – I just could – when I, seeing people laugh at it, I actually felt scared of like that mob of people because I was like, who are these people? I'm now like afraid of a group that – like co-sign that in that way and then i was like okay but another group might not and like how does this what the fuck is going on so that actually almost made me like more interested like what is what's the deal here like okay this thing that i really like now i've seen an aspect of it that wasn't for me but this is a lot more complicated than i thought and that made me that made me i don't know it wasn't even really a a question the the times where i've like even questioned stand up more were actually as I've gotten like more and more and more into it where I think, I think the times where I was most like fuck was even was after the, I did, um, I think after I did the just for laughs, new phases, I, that's when it got even more, conf- cause I was like in the beginning, it was like, there's always something to like really clear to work towards. So I was like, okay, I gotta do this. Then I got to New York. Then I got to get in at this club. And then I got to get a late night set. And then I got to do this. But then if you do some of those things and check those off, but you're like, I don't know what I was expecting. And then, I mean, now it's like, okay, you got to build your own audience and do your own thing. But that more was when I was kind of like that. I remember when I was, um, I guess when I, after I've been doing comedy for like four years, so two in Boston, two in New York, I, and I graduated grad school, I stopped doing stand up for a full year because I was like, I got to try to do something else. Was it just like not, I guess that there was no finish line or something or what, like what, what led you to stop? I was so overwhelmed because I was in New York and when I graduated, I was like, how the fuck am I going to pay to live in New York? Okay. And when I was in grad school, I was like a la- – I I had like – I was really lucky. I had like a one of my uncles was paying for it I had a, and I had a scholarship and I was working as a lab monitor like 10 hours a week. And then I was just leaving and doing bar shows and open mics. So I'm doing open mics from like 4 to 10 – 4 in the afternoon to 10 at night in New York. And – I used to drink a lot. I'm like drinking beer and Cadoba cups in class, like just a just a mess. Going back to New York, going back to Boston to get stage time, do shows, and then I was like, when I graduated, I fell asleep at the graduation just from exhaustion, and I studied media studies. So I was like, oh shit! Like at this point, I was like way more plugged into just like thinking of it as a business. And I was like, do I really want to? Is there? Can I give myself an opportunity to try to do something else? So that's when I tried to stop for that year. But then I was, I'd say like nine months into it, um, I was like, I really just want to keep doing entertainment. Yeah. So taking a break kind of probably made you really realize this is the path I want to go on. Yeah. And it was the best year of my life. The year going back to it, was it? No, the year I was taking a break because I realized I was like, oh, I can walk away and still be a person. It gave me some sense of agency because- before I was ever, no balance of life, everything I'm just running. I, there was no balance. I don't really have a life work balance now per se, but, but that it gave me a chance to be like, I can, I can, all these things I'm worried about, I can walk away. And there's something that with like Corona now, it's like all these things that we might be worrying about, something bigger can just like sideswipe it. And then it's like, oh, and we're still here. And we can't always predict everything, and we're certainly not in control of everything. You're probably far more aware of it, at least, even if you're saying you don't have that balance, you know that if you need it, it's there. Right. And look, sure, look, the world is giving it to us right now. Amen. On that first gig, you mentioned a joke that the host did, but do you remember your first joke that night? (laughs) I was hoping you wouldn't ask. Um, (laughs) I don't, but I bet it was so bad, man. I mean, I remember I had some joke about that I actually ended up like, like, it was like the nucleus of 
Oh, okay. The, the, all right. I remember this joke talking about my my dad wiggling his head when he doesn't want to say a word, but I, it was like it it wasn't a joke, and also it it technically was an act out, but I, I spent like four minutes getting to it. But I also was trying to write some joke about how when you buy a website URL, you can tell where you're at in life because it was completely not relatable. And it was because when I was, I had bought a website where I was trying to invent something. So I was like, you know, when you're in your after college, when you try to invent something and you buy a website for it, which no one is like, yeah. Like I was talking about this very bizarre specific experience I had and I was trying to write a joke about it. And when you say something like that, people are like, wait, what'd you try to invent? What the fuck are you talking about? So I, had this, <laughs> I had something where I was like, just not aware enough to be like, no, what you experience, you have to build a bridge to tie it in. People might relate to frustration, but they're not going to relate to buying a fucking website about stop the scuff. Like it. So I tried to make some joke about buying a website for my, but it was very based on like, you know, when one does that and no one knew like, it was like, what is this person? What are you talking about? So I don't remember. I don't think I had a thing I could even repeat because it, I didn't have any punchline to anything. But that I remember trying to talk about buying a website. Well, look, if it helps you, that's something I can relate to. The amount of <gasps> URLs I've bought and then you design the logo for the URL and then you don't yes. continue with the project whatsoever. Exactly. Over and over again. Before you went up on stage that night. If I could take you tonight and bring you back there to, you know, oh boy, smelling the crabs and hearing the crabs and worrying about your mother in the corner. If you just had five minutes with yourself and took yourself aside and could talk to yourself back then, what do you think you'd say to yourself now? I think I would say if I was being totally honest, I'd be like, look, there is no way this is going to go well. You don't ha because that's the kind of room where it's like, go up and you have to be so in your zone and doing your polished material that they will get on board with you as you just like work it. But it's got to be like, like those shows in Vegas are pretty rowdy that I do. Cause it's like, it's Vegas, it's a casino, they're drunk. And it's, I usually do 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. It's a showcase. Four comics are doing that amount of time. And it's like, you do your most polished stuff. Cause if they start to get control, it's a tough, you know, or you're just doing crowd work where you're like going in, in a way I would have had no chance so i would just say like this there's no there is a skill set you can develop you don't have it right now so just go up there and it doesn't matter and it's fine and like fuck these people and try one of the goddamn crabs that everyone's chomping <laughs> on because maybe they're good maybe you're missing the point of the whole thing well look let's leave it there thank you so much for chatting about your first gig with me yeah thank you i appreciate it very much There we have it. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. Fantastic chat. What a horrific first gig. Like, imagine that. Like a crab shack. I don't even know what a crab shack is, but it's not somewhere where I want to gig. I want to gig in a comedy club. Somewhere called a crab shack. I don't even like crabs, so, like, I wouldn't even be able to eat the things. I feel like crab shacks would do good wings. Hopefully chicken wings. If there are fish wings, do fish wings exist? Obviously fish don't have wings, but maybe fish-flavored wings. Yep, did a quick google fish wings exist so anybody there who thought fish don't have wings shut up in your face uh thank you so much for joining me guys have you had fun emma fantastic comedian now based out of los angeles but if you're in the states check her out she'll be traveling all over when we're allowed to once again if you're in our college record that and send it to us please Go follow her online, Twitter, I am Emma Willman, Facebook, Emma Willman Comedy, Instagram, Emma Willman, or emmacomedy.com. We're all mad to do podcasts in this whole quarantine thing, so Emma said she's got a new podcast coming called Emma's Bunker. It's not ready to be launched just yet, but it is coming soon to help ease the boredom and just, you know, help create content and maybe use this time a bit wisely. So if you're interested and you want to hear Emma's Bunker, follow her on Instagram at Emma Willman for information on when that's going to drop for the first time guys thank you so much for joining if you did enjoy leave a review on apple Podcasts. leave a review on spotify subscribe have i do i say that subscribe please subscribe leave a review help get this up we've got great guests coming every week so be good if people are listening to it share it if you're listening right now give it a share and i'll i will break the social distancing and i'll come and kiss you or if you that's not something you want i'll go do that Follow the podcast at My First Gig Pod. Follow me at Dwayne Dugan. And look, stay cozy, stay inside, stay healthy, save lives, 
See you next week. Bye. It's the My First Gig Podcast. Whoa.